Hi, I'm Kirby Allison, and we love to help the well-dressed acquire and care for their wardrobes. Today in our Shoeshine Sunday series, I'm sitting here with bespoke tailor Eric Jensen, part of the new generation of up-and-coming bespoke tailors who are uh, popping up around New York City. We just finished fitting, uh, my first fitting, of a dark gray fresco single-breasted suit that just went beautifully. Our Shoe Sign Sunday series is where we sit down with various people and just chat about their histories and backgrounds and opinions on various subjects. And so um, I'm going to be shining a pair of my uh, bespoke black cap toe uh, George Cleverly shoes. And uh, Eric is wearing uh, some suede boots, which, you know, really don't have much to offer in terms of being shined. So <laughs> he's actually going to be doing a little bit of basting work uh, on the jacket he fit me for today. So uh, Eric, hey, thank you so much for coming out to Dallas. Glad you know, to be we've here. known each other for several years and it's great to finally, you know, really see you, um, you know, kind of going out on your own and starting your own shop in New York City and you just moved into your own, uh, you know, uh, workroom atelier. Yes. And, uh, very excited about it, yeah. You, we, you knew me when I was still apprenticing. So. I did, you know, back <laughs> whenever you were with Chris Despis in yes. Chicago. You know, help me understand, I mean, how did you get started in tailoring? I mean, uh, of all the career tracks that an American could take, I mean, you're you know, from California, the kind of the Seattle area. I mean, how did you decide on bespoke tailoring? Well, it's a really long story. I'm happy to tell it. Yeah, well, we've got time, so. <laughs> so you can tell my shoes, you know. Need a good shine? Basically, it started, I was uh, waiting for my wife to get her hair cut in San Francisco, and I was reading a GQ, and in the GQ they were doing an article about Seville Row, and I was reading the article and I was really, you know, kind of impressed by it, and so when my wife and I were eating lunch after she got her hair d done, I told her, you know, I want to learn how to make suits, and she said, why? And I was like, well, I was reading this article and it's just really, really cool, and I think it's really beautiful art. And she was like, okay. And so I went and bought one of those uh, repair kits from the grocery store and I ripped apart my pajamas at the time and tried to figure out, you know, how to put them back together and how to sew them and I tried to stitch them by hand and figure it out. And I spent the last, the next probably year, two years fumbling my way through it. And then at home by yourself, at home by myself, trying to figure something out. And then in 2009, I was working at TD Ameritrade doing uh, work with IRAs and uh, retirement plans. And um, that was when the market crashed, you know, got laid off and I was with my wife and she was like, well, what are you gonna do now? And I said, well, I, now I really wanna learn how to make suits. I really wanna do something fun with my life. I don't wanna end up back in a, in a cubicle. She said, okay, well, what are you gonna do? And I said, well, there was a tailor at the time in San Diego who um, was making suits. And I said, well, I'm gonna ask him if he'll take me on. So I went in and asked him, you know, if he'd take me on, if he'd let me learn under him. And he said, how old are you? And I was 25 at the time. He said, no one under 75 is doing this. Why do you want to learn this? It's a, it's a dying art. And I said, I just find it beautiful. I find it fascinating. I just, I would love to learn it. And he said, well, I'll tell you what, you come in, I'll teach you some stuff, see how we get along. Um, but I can't promise you anything. I'm really, really busy. So I said, all right. So next day I showed up and he said, oh, you actually showed up. And I said, yeah. So he put me to work and he taught me how to make buttonholes. So I made buttonholes uh, for him, or practiced for the next probably two months. And in Bespoke, we make buttonholes by hand, even down to the most tedious thing as a buttonhole, it's done by hand. So I did that for about two months, and then a guy- Really testing your resolve. Yeah, testing your resolve. And buttonholes, they take a long time and a lot of patience, and you're kind of really, really uh, bent over them for a while. So anyways, a gentleman comes in who gets his suit made all over the world, and he says, um, he says, hey, I've seen you here a couple of times. You're trying to learn this. And I said, yeah. He said, you should go learn in Italy. And I said, yeah, right, man, like, I've got a boatload of cash, you know, no problem, I'll go learn in Italy. And he's like, no, seriously, you have any kids? And I said, no. He said, you have a house? And I said, no. He said, well, you got nothing tying you down, you're young, why don't you go learn in Italy? He said, there's a master tailor there who's uh, looking for apprentices. So I went... Um, and how did he know this? Did, did... There's an article, actually, on Style Forum about uh, my master tailor, Luigi Gallo, and then also the Brioni School. Um, so I had first tried to get in the Brioni School because I had heard of Brioni and they had no idea how to get someone who's an American into the Italian school. So um, I ended up um, researching more about Luigi Gallo and then um, I found his information and I emailed him and uh, his daughter wrote me back and said, yeah, we're, we're taking apprentices and um, we were, we'd be happy to look into you, you need to, if you could write a little more about yourself and your experience and whatnot. So I wrote them and, and everything, and um, they wrote back and said, yeah, they'll accept me. If I can come out, they'll give me a student visa, and, and they, I can go. They had started a school at the time, 
So I could work under the school, work there at, and go to the school, and then also after school go and apprentice under him. So I told my wife, and I said, you know, I got accepted, and she said, well, let's go. So I said, really? And she said, yeah. So we sold everything we owned. We lived off of soup and bread, basically, for half a year, and, um, and left for Italy. And I apprenticed under him for uh, about two and a half years, and um, I learned everything. I learned how to make a pattern. I learned how to how to cut, how to make coats, how to make trousers, and everything in the old Italian tradition, which is by hand. You know, and, and this a, was in Rome? This was in Rome, yeah. And the main thing I learned there was c'è uno sistema di lavoro. And there's a system of work, and you don't mess with that system, because that system's been in place for hundreds of years. And you honor that. Every time you make a coat, you honor that system. And so every time I make a coat, I make sure that I maintain that honor. And, uh, and what is that system? How would you describe that? It's, it's the integrity of the craft. It's the integrity of the make. It's you don't cut corners. You don't do things that you shouldn't do. If this lapel, when you put a lapel on, you put it on, on this way because we've been doing this for hundreds of years and it's, it's beautiful. And it works. And it works and it's beautiful. And so that's it's basically you it. saying, you know, there's certain things that, you know, we question, but there's certain things we don't. Exactly. Like uh, in, in Italy, there's a, there's a pasta caccio e pepe. Okay. And it's basically just cheese and peppers, or cheese and pepper, uh, ground pepper. And you don't add anything else to it. And the reason why is because the cheese that you use is pecorino, which is salty. And the pepper you add to help combat that, that saltiness of the pecorino. And that goes together, it pairs beautifully. And the reason why it pairs beautifully is because it's, it's something that's been done through tradition and something that they've understood in the way that they've perfected this dish. And to have it any other way is just not cacio e pepe. So to make a suit in any other way is... It's not a suit. <laughs> so how was that? I mean, you landed in Italy. I mean, did you speak Italian? And, you know? No, no. I mean, we took one course of, um, my mom and dad got my wife and I a um, Rosetta Stone CD. <laughs> like the first, the first level, you know? So we took the first level of Rosetta Stone. for the that, first... That's going to get you far in Italy. Yeah, yeah. For like three months. And um, so we did the three months of, um, of Rosetta Stone and then... Um, <clears throat> We were flying to Italy, and basically, we had found a place outside of Italy to live, to rent a room from. It was a Bible college that was outside of Italy, or outside of Rome. And um, so we rented a place there, and the guy who you know, was running the school picked us up from the airport and took us back to the hotel. And then after, he said, you know, I'm going back into town. If you guys need it, I can help you buy some things, you know. Um, you're going to need tickets, bus tickets and train tickets to get into Rome every day. And I said, yeah. He said, well, come with me, and I'll, and I'll buy that for you. So I go, okay. I took Rosetta Stone, and I know that a ticket, the word for ticket is biglietto. So I know biglietto. So we go down to the, magazines, the magazine stand, because that's where you buy your tickets in Rome. Uh, and uh, the guy goes up to the little lady behind the counter, and he's going to buy our train tickets. And I'm waiting for the word biglietto. And he never says it. And they're having this big conversation back and forth, blah, 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 blah. And he comes back and turns to me. He says, you can't buy a month pass, but you can buy a weekly pass. Do you want to do that? And I said, yeah. And in my head, I'm going, the man never said biglietto. How am I ever going to do this? So we got into Rome, uh, and we, I met my master tailor, and he didn't speak any English, Luigi Gallo. And the only way I learned is, I mean, I picked up the language throughout the years, but the only way that I really learned how to make was I watched my master coat maker, and he would do things, and I would just, I would replicate what he did. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I learned more by failing than I did by actually doing anything right. So. And so how many other apprentices were there with you? So the school, there was four other, five other people during the school, but after the school, the only me and one other guy stayed after for the apprenticeship. Okay. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, so we'd go to school from 9 a.m. till about 1, and then school would break out, yeah. and then he'd, Mr. Gallo would go back to running the tailor shop, you know. And then we'd work after probably from 2 to 7 or 2 to 8 p.m. just doing apprentice work. We'd make sleeves or pad collars or pad lapels or things like that. And that's uh, amazing. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I mean, the Italian style of tailoring is probably the most diverse of any of the countries. I mean, Italy is a long country. Yeah. You know, you've got Naples in the south and you've got Milan in the north and, you know, Rome. Um, I mean, you know, for someone that's not very familiar with the various kind of styles of tailoring in Italy, you know, can you describe those to us? Because, I mean, they are so varied. They are. They're very varied. And in fact, even to, for me to describe each region, I probably wouldn't do it justice. I mean, just for instance, like in Rome, 
a Roman suit, most people think of a Roman suit as what Brioni makes, which is you know padded and rolled and, and a little bit fuller in the chest. But the suits that Gallo made in Rome was what I would call very Napoleon in its style. Um, so the front chest dart of most coats finish at the pocket. But ours and Napoleon coats, the front chest dart goes all the way down to the hem. That creates a little more of a drape kind of uh, look to the skirt, and the skirt's your bottom half of your coat, um, as opposed to what the English do, which they usually cut in three pieces, which will be a front, a side body, and a back. Um, the Italians only cut in two for the most part. But then you have Florentines, like Liverano, Liverano, and they don't cut a front dart at all. But that's still considered basically middle of the country, not so much north. Mm -hmm. It's kind of north, but it's not like fully north like the, like the Milanese. And the Milanese will cut um, kind of like what um, Caraccini will cut. And I think their front dart ends at the pocket, but they cut in two pieces still as well. And they cut the front dart and the end of the arm dart as well. Um, their coats usually have a little more structure to them, um, a little more shoulder pad, a little more um, in, the, in the roll in the lapel or in the sleeve head. But then Gallo and us Romans and I would say even Napoleons, we tear out most of everything from the coat. So it's just the horsehair canvas and then the body canvas, usually no pads. So my coat here has no pads, so it's really easy, soft, light to wear. But Not even the way that you're constructing your canvas is different. Yeah, so even the way that they're constructing their canvas is different. Right, because you know, normally you'd have you know, the the body canvas, then you'd have the horsehair canvas, and then you'd have um, a, usually a, I think it's called dormit in, 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 in English, but I can't, I don't melting, know. Melting, right? It's, it's, yeah, it's melting, it's like a flannel almost. Mm -hmm. um, so then they'll have the flannel over that, so there's three layers. But our, my coat, Gallo's coat and then Appleian's coat, usually will only have just the two layers, the horsehair and then the body canvas. And the body canvas for us is very, very lightweight. You know, the goal of my suit, and I think most southern Italians and even Gallo suit is to be kind of effervescent when you wear it. It's very soft, it's very light, it's not really there. Um, it's kind of, I don't want rigidity, you know, but at the same time I want comfortability. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's those two dichotomies that need to, maintain, need to maintain themselves. If you want the most layman's terms of the differences between the Italian styles, um, they're all there. That, that's what I would say it's there. But I think for the most part, you're looking at a very soft, simple to wear coat, no matter, even if you're at Southern, you know, in Sicilia and Palermo, yeah. or if you're all the way up in the North. And but it, st it still looks clean. I mean, it's yeah, no, it's still a very clean coat and still shape. I would say Gallo's coat has more shape than a Napoleon's coat, but that's very general. I mean, that's a very generalized statement. How has your style kind of evolved? I mean, as you've gotten into tailoring, you know, you know, you came back to the United States, you apprenticed under Chris. I mean, Chris yeah. has a very unique style. Chris has a very Milanese style. So Chris, I would say, is very, uh, not to speak for the man, because, you know, I, would, I don't know how much I'd like people speaking for me, but as far as I would know, Chris has a very Milanese style. I think he's very impressed by the Milan style. Mm -hmm. So it's still very rooted in Italian um, style, but it has a little more structure, a little more rigidity to it than the Southern Italians. The Southern Italians really kind of like that idea of, La dif il difetto e l'effetto, mm -hmm. so the defect is the effect. So to show that it's handmade, there's a, they always leave a little bit of a defect to it. It's just to, it's that pro proof that it's handmade. Because it's if anything's too perfect, it's machine done. Yeah. And so you kind of want that little bit of imperfection to show that it's made by hand. There's a little it's very Italian. Yeah, yeah. That, that approach. Yeah, but Chris, I would say, is more in the Milanese stance where it's more. In, more focused on trying to get it as perfect as possible. But how has your style evolved? I mean, so, you know, you came from Rome, you were doing this kind of hybrid Roman uh, Neapolitan style. Um, you know, what, what are you cutting now? I mean, is it still very much kind of harking back to that, yeah, that kind so, of tradition? Yeah, so I came full circle. I, um, and I, I just, when I got back from Italy, I was so tired of the Italian code, and I think it was just because I was so immersed in it. That I, and I was really impressed by David Taub and what David Taub was doing at the time. Um, so David Taub was now with Geeves and Hawks. Okay. I think at the time he was with uh, Andrew Ramromp. Um, so anyways, I was really impressed with what he was doing. I really liked the rope on the shoulders. I really liked the heavy um, shoulder pad. I really liked the exaggeration, the chest to waist to hip ratio. I just thought it was really cool. Um, and it looked great on a mannequin and I really liked the way it looked when I made it on a mannequin, but I never liked wearing it because I always felt like the coat wore me, if that makes any sense. Like I, it was 
it was there and it was encompassing and it was kind of, yeah, it was taking away from, from my movements and from my expression and stuff. So I began ripping everything out of my coats again and went back to the basics of, and the foundation of what I learned, that Sistema de la Lodo. Mm -hmm. And so through, through that process, I learned what I personally liked to wear. And I really liked wearing the Italian coat and I really liked, that was what I pulled out of the closet. That's what I threw on. That's when, you know, I didn't, if I didn't want to think about, you know, what coat I need to wear today, I, I put on my Italian cuts. So now my, my house style is very, how I, how I started, how I began, um, very influenced by my training in Rome. I like the shape that, you know, Chris always put into his coats in, the, in regards to the waist suppression. I always thought that was beautiful and the way that he could make most any man have that shape, um, you know, even if you don't have it intrinsically or, you know, naturally, mm -hmm. uh, he could give you that shape. And so I always try to maintain that from what I learned from Chris, because I always thought that was beautiful in his coats. Um, but I like the way that Gallo's coats wore um, in the shoulder. I like the way they wore uh, in their softness and their easy, easy to wear um, kind of uh, construction. So, so I kind of merged the two, um, but I'm, and because Chris was so influenced by Italy and, and I was trained in Italy, that's really kind of my preference and my, and my way to make. And so, yeah, if I was to describe my house style, it's, it's soft, high armhole, um, easy to wear, no, little to no shoulder pad, nothing in the sleeve head, a spalla camicia or a spalla mapina, manica mapina, either one um, is kind of really what I prefer in a coat. Yeah. What about double-breasted or single-breasted? Do you have any kind of preferences or general kind of sartorial you know, positions? Uh, they're, they're both beautiful. I mean, I can't say one's better than the other or one's more elegant than the other or one's more of my favorite. I will say that it is much harder to fit and to get a double-breasted right than it is to get a single-breasted right. So when a tailor really, really hits a double-breasted, it's the most beautiful thing in the world. Because the way what is it? What is it about that, that? You have more cloth and you have more room for the coat to fall away or the coat to scissor or the coat to be out of alignment and balance um, because of the way that the length is from the angle of the neck point to the buttoning point. Um, so when that all comes together and when that's dialed in beautifully, that's probably one of the most beautiful things. But then you have things like um, morning coats and, and tails. I mean, tails, if you can get tails sitting correct, that's... Have you ever done a set of tails? Uh, we made some in Italy, but I've never, haven't made one in, 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 prop, in my, under my own label. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, someday it would be fantastic. So you have a very unique, you know, very Italian approach to your, your house style of trousers. Yeah. So, you know, describe those for us and... So, um... Well, one thing that I learned from Chris that I always take to heart is if you're making a suit, you have a pleated trouser with it because that just makes, it's just such a more elegant way to, to present yourself. It's a more cohesive suit. I There's can't stand unpleated trousers. It would be, it would almost be a travesty to have a bespoke suit made without pleats. I agree. And I think that a pleat is the most beautiful thing on a, on a trouser. The problem is, is that what happened was in the 80s and the 90s, the pleat got exaggerated and it became superfluous because they used to wear a lower waisted trouser and then they'd add like two, three pleats and you became this balloon pant. Um, so the, the reaction to that became what happened, what's happening now in, or what happened, you know, five, ten years ago is they trimmed up the pants and they took the pleats out and they lowered the waist and, and you just got a really ugly tr reverse trouser. And so instead of a balloon trouser, now you have just this little stick trouser. But in reality, a pleat should not add to the bulk of the trouser when the client is standing. It's only there to give you room for when you sit down. Because when you're, when you're sitting, your muscles expand. Or, and, and your body expands in your hip area, and so it gives you that room to actually sit down. But in reality, the pleat shouldn't add anything to your trouser when you're standing. So, if anything, I feel like the pleat also helps give a little bit of room so that you're able to create a beautiful drape. Exactly, and that's another standing, thing. Whereas, you know, if you don't have pleats, you just pull across the front. Yes. And it's possibly one of the most inelegant yes. things. And then even if your trousers look perfect with no pleats, the moment that you put your hands in your pockets or you put a pair of a set of car keys or a wallet, you know, you see it immediately. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it becomes evident. Yeah. 
Yeah. So what about single pleats, double pleats, reverse pleats, forward pleats? Uh, it, personal opinion. What's your personal? Personal opinion, I always like a single, single reverse or double reverse. Uh, I like the idea of a forward pleat. Um, I just sometimes don't like uh, the way that they present themselves on, on, when some people cut them. They have a tendency to bow um, when, when they're cut wrong, and they can be cut wrong um, with ease. Um, so I, I, I like the clean line and the, sim and the simple line of a, of a reverse pleat. But I will say that I have no care between a single or a double pleat. I feel like a double pleat looks really, really elegant um, as well as intriguing. So I like those as well. But to be honest, I wear both all the time. Um, but my trousers are usually, unless the client specifies, buttoned fly. Um, we do an a, a elongated um, waistband so that the it goes all the way across, all the way into the seam of the trouser on the far side. Um, and then we also do a tira la pancha on the inside, which is the piece that buttons and stays closed, um, no matter if you've unbuttoned your trousers or not. And so. Is that something you would do just for trousers with braces or? All, all, trousers. all trousers. Yeah, any trouser I make, unless really, really specified by the client, um, are made in that fashion. And that's just because that's how I was trained and I find that to be a very comfortable trouser and an easy to wear trouser and an easy to, uh, to, um, to take on and off trouser. That's one of the reasons I really, I can't stand a trouser with a full button fly. Oh, yeah. So especially the Italians. I mean, some of the Neapolitan trousers, I mean, you've got to go through 20 buttons before you actually get the trouser, you know, undone. Yeah, our, our know, trousers. Absolutely maddening. <laughs> our trousers are about 20 buttons. No, you're I looking mean, at about five. I mean, if you, I mean, it does look nice, and it's, there's certainly a lot of finesse and kind of craftsmanship and handwork and having so many buttons. But pragmatically, you know, at the end of the day, or, you know, shoot, even throughout the day, you know, it's uh, you, you would a little be, too much fuss for me. You would be surprised. I have a client who was so terrified to have the buttons on the trousers, and he told me later that after he wore them, uh, he had to run in, to the bathroom rather quickly and was nervous that he wasn't going to be getting the trousers <laughs> undone <laughs> in time. And he actually said it was surprisingly quick and easy to yeah, take. Yeah, you had, you had to replace all the buttons afterwards. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> he, he ripped them off. <laughs> no, it's a, it actually, uh, it was one of the best compliments I've ever had because I, I made him a believer. <laughs> Ooh, that's funny. Well, I'm not quite there yet, but maybe, maybe on my next pair. I was going to say, we'll get you there. <laughs> uh, well, what, I mean, you know, what have you seen? I mean, you know, I feel like, you know, a lot of uh, people, especially younger people kind of our age, are, you know, getting more interested in having things made. And, you know, my whole entire thesis is that, you know, own less but of a higher quality. I mean, is that something you're seeing in New York? Uh, I'm, I'm hoping to see it. I think um, we're a very throwaway culture. Uh, I think we've been kind of built to be a throwaway culture. So if it, if it doesn't last or if it doesn't fit or if it's got a little something wrong with it, we toss it. Our grand, great grandparents and grandparents used to fix yeah. things and mend things and darn things and you know like even what you're doing now you're repurposing a shoe that you know an un, untaught person or a person who didn't know that you could do these things in order to create that shine back into the shoe maybe would have tossed them or pushed them in the back of their closet you know and gotten a new and you know purchased a new pair. So the difference though is in bespoke is. One, everything is made of a higher quality and a high, to a higher standard and to a higher degree because there's all this handwork put into it. But at the same time, there's also allowances built into the coats so that as you grow and as you change, um, those things can um, be taken care of. You can have your coat let out. You can have it taken in. You can, you know, uh, do things in regards to the shoulders if you change the way that you stand and stuff like that. So those allowances are built in because your coat is your coat and it wants, we want it to be your coat for a long, long time. How would you describe the purpose of all the handwork? Like, is handwork just handwork for the sake of handwork? Or? No, no, if it was, I mean, if it was, it'd just be superfluous and it'd be a waste of time. And to be honest, the last nine years of my life would be a waste. But no, the, there's purpose between everything on you know, everything. So just for instance, like, <clears throat> this is all the handwork that goes into the chest. 
And what happens is, is as you pad the stitches by hand, you roll the canvas um, a little bit. So you create that arc that is the chest. And over time, it actually learns the body even more as you wear it. Um, and then, so you can also see that these, these stitches go up and down, and that creates that arc. These stitches go across, and that creates the hollow of your, of your um, shoulder bone. Mm -hmm. So where your chest is full here, your hollow here. And so those stitches create that. And then these stitches go at an angle, and they push out like that. And, and that's so that the shoulder stays up and holds its shape mm -hmm. when it's off your, your shoulder. So all of these hand stitches um, create a purpose. And in fact, no machine can do what, the, what your hand can do. Yeah. And the most beautiful thing is you were given the greatest machine in the entire world, and, and we've forsaken that machine. But your hand is actually the greatest machine anyone's ever invented. Yeah. Um, so we do that for the chest. We do that for the roll of the lapel. So on the lapel, we'll do the same thing, and that'll create that beautiful roll. Mm -hmm. So instead of having a dead lapel, where it just kind of slacks to your, to your chest, this one has a roll to it and some life and, 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 and some beauty to it. Same thing happens with the collar. Uh, the same thing we do when we attach to the lapel so we can add fullness. So when we put the facing on, we can add the fullness to the facing. Same, um, yeah, it's the same thing we do when we do the hand stitches, uh, hand pick stitches, and that helps to reinforce yeah. the seams. I mean, one of the things that I think is uh, you know, really interesting about a bespoke suit or a bespoke jacket is that you know, all the handwork doesn't make a more delicate jacket. Really, it makes a hardier, more durable jacket. Yeah. I mean, that's the purpose of the handwork is that, you know, a proper bespoke jacket looks great all the time because, again, that finesse and that work is locked into it through the handwork. And so, you know, you can take a, a bespoke jacket and it really doesn't, it's not delicate. I mean, you can throw it into the back of your car or you can throw it into an overhead bin, you know. No, I mean, not that you should do that casually, but, uh, you know, the yeah. point is, is that, you know, the jacket is able to live with you and still look great versus being something that, you know, has to be, you know, handled with delicate with care. delicate care. No, you're exactly right. And that's, um, that's one of the greatest things, and especially about the Italian coat is because of its softness and because of its lightness and because it's, you know, not so built up or anything, you can actually, you know, fold it up and then unfold it and it still holds that chest shape. It still holds that shoulder shape. Um, without having all the extra padding and the extra stuff in it. Um, but yeah, you're, you're totally right, and it's something that's not seen on coats nowadays. Well, and it's not even something discussed. I mean, people think, uh, the handwork is to create the shape, and the handwork is to create the shape, but really just as important as creating the shape is, um, you know, really uh, the integrity behind it so that it, it keeps its shape. Yep, and maintains that shape. And maintains that exactly. shape. Exactly. And so talk to me, I mean, so canvases, right? So, I mean, you know, even with bespoke or made to measure jackets, I mean, you know, the way that a jacket can be made, you know, I mean, it's such a huge spectrum. You know, nobody is ever gonna see the work that you're doing right now once the jacket is finished. And there's other people that'll do all that work, but it's done by machine with a, a blind stitching machine. Yeah. And so they'll still say, ah, oh, yes, we have a fully canvassed, floating canvas, you know, jacket, but you know, all things aren't created equal. So describe a little bit about kind of the differences there and kind of, again, the importance of that in the long run. When I first started working um, or learning, uh, and I learned, when I learned how to, when I started learning my first coat, so we went through a long process and, and finally by um, the second year that I was in Italy, my master tailor said, okay, buy cloth and, um, and we'll start making a coat. So I bought the cloth and my master tailor helped me with the pattern and, and Mark striking out the pattern and, and helped me with cutting it. Uh, and then we prepped it and the next thing I did was prep the canvas, which is the interiors, and then you have to marry the two. So you have to marry the cloth with the canvas. And, um, and, and it's actually a very, very delicate and, and involved process. And most people take it for granted because you know it's just canvas, it's just on the inside. But you have to have them together so that they marry um, perfectly, but at the same time, the canvas is not attached to the cloth, except for, you know, at your shoulder seam, where your pockets are, and then at your edge seam. But other than that, in the middle, it's all free, kind of floating. Um, so you have to be able to put those two pieces of cloth together in a way in which 
one's not tighter than the other in, in the wrong areas and not looser than the other in the wrong areas. Uh, so needless to say, it took me uh, probably an entire day of stitching and ripping and stitching and ripping and stitching and ripping before my master coat maker told me that I put the canvas in correctly. Really? So you, it, it's a hard, long training process in order to put the canvas in correctly. So just because you have a floating canvas doesn't really mean much. It has to be put in correctly and it has to be married with the top yeah. cloth. Well, and just even how the canvas is created, right? Because there's oh, yeah. still some bespoke tailors or people that say that they do bespoke and they use pre-made canvases. Pre-made canvases. And there's no shape to it. No. Nope. And uh, you know, again, I mean, you're building your canvases up by scratch, you're darting your canvas. Yeah, and you, and you have know, to dart it in the correct position and you have to put the dart, the right dart there and you have to make sure that you have one. But that's as specific as the pattern making. I mean, that's oh, yeah. unique to the client. Yeah, definitely. Definitely unique to the client and definitely just as important as the pattern that's underneath it. Interesting. And then the blind stitch, I mean, again, you know, you can use a little blind stitching machine, you know, to again, blind stitch the canvas to the lapels. But again, it doesn't create any of the roll. Any of no, that. no, because like, so when I pad stitch to the lapel, for instance, uh, you start with these V stitches. So you start with a V just like this. You start like that. Your next stitch, you're rolling the cloth while you stitch it. So you're actually imparting that roll into the canvas and the cloth as they come together. Mm -hmm. A blind stitch can't do that. Only a, what blind stitches were made for was to hem trousers quickly. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't, it doesn't pull, it doesn't roll the cloth. And then now you have machines nowadays that they actually do call them pad stitching machines, but they still can't give you that feel that your hands can. Because your hands can one roll and two feel how much that roll is going to take. I'm telling you, there's nothing that can replace the greatest machine you've ever been given, yeah. which is your hands. And so you're really feeling the garment whenever you're doing it. And that's yeah. uh, part of, I guess, a master tailor is, you know, having done it, you know, hundreds of times or thousands, yeah. you know, you, you know, really get a, a feel for the garment. And at that point, that's where it becomes natural and you make yeah. it look easy, but it's, it's anything but. But it's never easy. I mean, even my master tailors who I've trained under told me. What's the most easy. frustrating part about it? I mean, tailoring, I mean, it seems, this, you know, it's, it's gotta every, be like, I mean, it's gotta be, I would imagine just incredibly challenging because no two clients are the same, no two fabrics are the same. Yeah. It's, and you know, there's so much handwork that goes into something that when I'm sure it's not right, you just, yeah, you, you, you cringe when it's not right. But the, to getting to what you were saying, like, first of all, every cloth reacts differently. Every cloth shows differently. Every cloth feels differently in the hand and has to be, you know, dealt with accordingly. Um, also, every client is different. And the other thing is, it's not, we're not doing geometry. You know, there's no rules. There's no hard and fast if this happens, this happens type of thing. You know, everything can become a gray area. So it's up to the, to the tailor, uh, especially the gentleman fitting, you know, the master tailor, to be able to read the cloth and read it correctly and to know what that cloth is telling them. And even then, you could read it wrong or you could read what you're reading and it doesn't make any sense, you know? So, like when I was fitting you, I, it didn't make any sense because it looked like you had a more round in your back and if you have more round in your back you need more length over that mm -hmm. so you need a longer back but then it was also showing me that it was kind of pooling up at your at your waist which tells me that you have a, you have too much length in your back so it's this it was this dueling kind of thing that was going on with the back of your coat and that's the main thing and just sometimes i mean you just have to like play that through the fittings i mean because again yeah you know, there's other people that are like you know we'll take your measurements and we'll send you a bespoke garment straight to completion and i just you know it's really not bespoke if it doesn't have fittings yeah no and that's the hallmark of a bespoke suit if you're not getting um you know i don't want to put a quantitative effect on this but if you're not getting at least two fittings you know on your first commission something's wrong um, and especially if you're getting the completed garment after they take your measurements, um, then that's definitely something. Yeah, I mean, that's the proper made to measure. Yeah, I mean, and, that's a proper made to measure. And the amount of handwork in a made to measure garment can be exceptional. Yes. But it's still, at the end of the day, a made to measure garment. Yeah, and so it's that, it's the hand thing, both those two items go hand in hand. It's the, it's the fitting, it's that personal effect of the fact that the, the suit is your suit. 
And so it's those fittings that are important with bespoke and it's the handwork. So it's, the, it's both of those two items that are very important. Yeah, what about turnips? Your cuffs, as we call them in America. Um, it's, a, it's a personal preference. It's the client's preference. Yeah, but large turnips seem to be coming back. I mean, I start, I mean I'm seeing more you know, really high-waisted trousers you know, with, uh, you, you know, do? single or double pleats, you know, two inch turnips, which I mean, that's, you know, that's a pretty significant turn up there. Yeah. The issue with fashion is there's no elegance in fashion. You know, and to me, fashion is something that's here today and then it changes because what, what happens in fashion is they have to keep selling you things. Yeah. So they have to tell so you So fashion by design has to change. Has to change. And if you are always dictated by fashion, you will never, you, you shouldn't buy bespoke if you're dictated by fashion. Because if you're dictated by fashion and you buy bespoke, you're spending a lot of money on something that you aren't gonna like in two to three years from now because fashion's gonna dictate that it's not in anymore. Whereas elegance, something that's strived for, that's maintained, that's this, um, this idea of just being, just being well-dressed, well-presented, a gentleman, uh, someone, someone who's got a fantastic aura or a fantastic kind of way of being is this elegance and elegance transcends time and so if you're dictated by fashion if you're dictated by two inch cuffs now you're going to come back to me two years from now and tell me to make them one and a half inches yes. and then you're going to come back three four years from then and tell me to put them back to two inches yeah. you know but if you're dictated by elegance you're dictated by what's beautiful and everybody knows what's beautiful yeah what about um, someone just looking to get started in building a wardrobe you know someone that was looking to you know really maybe have their first bespoke suit made or maybe you know, begin creating a bespoke wardrobe. Um, you know, how would you counsel and guide that person? First and foremost, listen to your tailor because they've been through it and they know. Um, a lot of people, a lot of times people don't want to listen to, uh, um, to advice because they think they know. Um, the worst thing a new person can do when they come to a tailor is to try to dictate the conversation and try to, to dictate the flow and the way that, that the relationship is going. A sartorial journey, unfortunately, always starts with a really bad hiccup um, because guys come in <clears throat> thinking that they want something, um, but in reality, a few years from now, they won't. I did the same thing when I first started making myself suits. I we had this conversation about, uh, was it belt loops or what would not? Maybe. No, mine was mine was trouser width and cloth style. Okay. So I chose, I wanted to trim trousers and the loud cloth. Uh, no cuffs or and no no pleats. No pleats. It was a conversation yeah. about pleats of how, you yeah. know, really those mistakes, you know, your father should prevent you from making. Yes, it. <laughs> exactly. No, and it's true because we didn't, we didn't get this, we never, we didn't have this generation that brought us to their tailor. You know what I mean? Your like father's your father's tailor and that, and Say, that. son, this is, no, you're yeah. getting pleats. Yeah. I mean, it's the same thing with shining shoes. I never learned to shine shoes properly. And I, you know, I bought a pair of, of shoes and I mucked them up in the first month and I thought that was it with them because no one taught me this is how you take care of your shoes, this is how you shine them. And no one brought me to a tailor, you know, when I was young. Um, and impressionable and, and had the ability to have that conversation of that sartorial journey. Um, so I had to learn it the hard way. Luckily, I made my own clothes, so I didn't have to pay for it, you know. But at the same time, there was a lot of things that I learned in that journey that uh, brought me to the point where um, ele elegance becomes something that becomes your driving aspiration when it comes yeah. to bespoke. And, and once you learn that that should be your driving aspiration, that's when your clothes start really, really coming into something really, really beautiful. So what do you see, I mean, elegance? I mean, someone that, you know, what's the first, you know, two or three or five pieces that, you know, you would counsel someone to, to build? I mean, you know, a normal person, businessman, you know, someone that is maybe working in a conservative environment, not someone that's looking to really kind of stand out or peacock. Yeah. And, you know, what, how would you guide them? I, I think that the, the essence uh, or the beginning stage is definitely to build that core w wardrobe. 
to build the wardrobe that's going to be something that's going to have longevity behind it. A lot of guys that come in for their first bespoke suit, if they've never even had one made before, want something exciting loud and, and exciting. loud. Because, I mean, look, when you come in, you are presented with all of these cloths, like, and, and they're beautiful. And they can, they can range from the obscene um, to, to the really, really beautiful in, in their simplicity. But you're presented with all of these. And when you first start going through them, if you don't have someone to guide you, your eye is going to jump for the most obscene cloth. Mm -hmm. And then you end up buying that. And if you don't have someone to guide you, if you don't have that relationship with a tailor who's going to help you say, you know, that's probably for later on down the road, um, you're going to end up commissioning that and you're not going to be happy in a year or so. Mm -hmm. um, so it's all about the beginning of a sartorial journey definitely takes place between the relationship between client and tailor. And that, that becomes its most that is the most important aspect of, of going to a tailor. So what may work for you may not work for somebody else. And so that's, that's the relationship between yeah. the client and tailor. But it's, it's really, re you know, it's uh, respecting and recognizing the expertise of a tailor. I mean, a great tailor should know his cloths, but he should also know his client well enough that he can make really relevant uh, and specific recommendations. Exactly, exactly. You know, I mean, you know, my first tailor, I mean, I, I don't think I ever chose a fabric, you know. You know, the fabric choice was a conversation of like, where are you gonna wear it? What do you want it for? Exactly. You know, you know, tell me about what you want out of this garment. And then he would go and select fabric and maybe he'd give me a, you know, an A or a B choice, you know, you know which one do you like, this or that? Uh, but, you know, he was, you know, the one that, you know, would reference his entire catalog of fabrics of which, you know, like what you said, there's thousands, and yeah. then, you know, come up with something, and, you know, I always said, you know, look, you decide, like, you're, you know the cloth better than I do. That's a, and that's a great relationship to be in with your tailor, and I think when Especially you, at the beginning, I mean, maybe one day, you know, I'll have been doing this for so long, and I've been, you know, I'll have, you know, a closet of a hundred garments, and, you know, I'll say, okay, well, you know, I know exactly what I want, but for someone that's looking to build a foundational wardrobe, or just, you know, lucky enough to buy one or two bespoke pieces defer to the tailor yeah you're you're always safer and it's a new world that type of mentality is a new world for someone first coming into to bespoke because a lot they're not used to it no you're not used to it because yeah, i mean everything's been a 22 year old salespeople that yeah say what do you want we've yeah, got yeah, it all we got it all and no oh, you won't want that i got this you want that i got this but because bespoke is all about building that relationship and building your wardrobe um, it's best to defer to the experts. I mean, that I wish, uh, honestly, when I was first making cloth, when I was first picking cloth for myself, I wish I had somebody, you know, paying attention to me. So <laughs> at the risk of oversimplification, do you have a favorite first garment to make someone? Someone that said, look, I'm starting from scratch, I don't have anything, you know, what do you recommend for me? I really like shark skins. I think shark skins are beautiful. Um, I think they have a great... Um, depth to them. A lot of times for clients who may not be new but are still in the beginning phases, I, I love frescoes. I think they wear, they tailor really, really well. I think they wear really well. I also think that um, if, if a client can get past the hand because they're a little rough in the hand, um, they actually make for incredible long-term um, cloth because uh, you can really you can really go to work on them, <laughs> um, and they'll they'll drop their wrinkles really easily. They'll they'll hold their strength. They'll hold their sh their shape really easily as well. Um, so I would say one for the for beginnings, I, I would pick something that's going to be more almost simplistic, but it's like pattern a, solid. Solid usually to start. I always try to to dark begin. light navy gray. That's going to the client's going to decide that because it all depends on what you're more comfortable with. Um, because at the, at the end of the day, I want you to grab what you feel the most comfortable in. And so I always have that conversation with clients is, you know, what do you feel the most comfor comfortable in or what do you feel is the more elegant of colors, a gray or a blue? And that usually dictates where we go from there. Um, because I think you and I had this conversation, you had said you gravitate more towards the grays. And, and in, in difference, I gravitate more towards blue. And so I had a client recently who we had this conversation with and he wanted this brown kind of loud check pattern. And I said, well, when you grab something out of your closet, what do you normally grab for? Like, and he said, blue. 
And I said, okay, and so that dictated where we went from there. We actually picked a really beautiful two-ply um, blue cloth, and he's gonna be more happy with that. So I think I'm done here. You, you know, it's an okay shine. I probably could have, I probably could have taken this down a little bit more, but uh, this will this will get me out tonight. You know, it looks beautiful. So you know, proper face. mirror shine yeah. is uh, you know really the, the gold standard, especially with the black shoe. Nothing looks more beautiful. No, nothing. Yeah. Well, thanks for your time, Eric. You know, yeah, I really appreciate, appreciate you sitting down with me. Uh, you know, anyone that's interested in learning more about Satorial Jensen, uh, you know, how do they find you? Uh, yeah, so you can find us on the web at www.sartoriajensen.com or um, Instagram if you want to see a lot of kind of the work and the craftsmanship behind uh, what we do, um, some of the finished products, some of just bits and pieces. Um, that's going to be Instagram is at um, Sartoria Jensen. And you know, you're based in New York, you've got a showroom in Man Manhattan. Yes, we're at uh, 120, uh, 118 East 28th Street now. And then are you traveling at all also? Um, I mean, occasionally when, when clients call for it, um, we do, uh, you know, if things, if we start progressing and start growing, we'll definitely want to add trunk shows and things like that as time goes on. Hey, well, thanks again. I can't wait to uh, see the suit and uh, looking forward to the second fitting. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks, Kurt.